Well, good evening, church. Yes, you know, in agreement with Justin, just continue to, to pray for us as, as we're pr- uh, planning, ask, seeking the Lord on, on what to do next. Uh, but tonight, tonight we are going to continue our study in, in 1 Corinthians. And um, as much as Justin thinks I'm a guest, uh, guest, special guest, I'm just going to go through the word as normal. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And just to recap what we covered, remember last week, uh, Paul started to address the questions that the Corinthians asked him, right? The first question they asked was about marriage, whether it was right or wrong to remain married or to marry. And his heart for the people, remember, was that they would just fully devote themselves to the Lord, right? Without any distraction. And he would just say, like, if you guys can, if you're single, remain single so that you can devote your life to the Lord. But Paul understood that not everyone has the gift to be single. And, and he had, uh, encouraged them for those who, who can't control their desires to marry. Right? He says that it's better, better to marry than to burn with passion. And he encourages those who are married to continue to remain married. Don't try to find ways to split up. Remain married because the Lord commands all married couples to keep their marriage vows. Now, in in chapter 8, he's going to address another question. And that question is, is it okay to eat meat offered to idols? You're probably thinking, what kind of of a question is that? Well, let me give you a little context. Well, the reason why this question was brought up to Paul was because in that day and age, the best place to, to buy meat wasn't from Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or, or Sprouts. The best place to buy meat was at meat shops operated by the temples. In Corinth, people would would offer animal sacrifices to their idols, and they would bring the best of the best meat, prime rib, New York steak, filet mignon, and probably a side of beef ribs with some barbecue sauce on the side too. But they would bring the meat, offer it to their idols, and just leave it there on the altar. But it wouldn't last long on the altar because they believe that the spirit of the idol will consume the spirit of the animal, and that would finish the meal for the idol. So what did the temples do with the prime meat that was left on the altar? Well, they were smart. You know, they would grab the, that, that, that good chunk of meat that they got for free and put it up for sale at half price. A smart business strategy there. The issue, though, And the reason why the Corinthian church is asking this question is because some of the Christians were purchasing meat from the meat shops that that were operated by the temples, and other Christians were offended by that. the, The offended Christian believed that the meat that was offered to the idol was tainted and corrupt by this spirit of the idol, and it should not be eaten by any Christian. Now, in today's day, we probably don't have that issue, right? From my understanding, in our current society, I don't think there's any meat that we can go and buy that was offered to an idol. And although we may not struggle with, with this particular issue, what we can take away from, chap- from this chapter is the theme that Paul is going to address here and in the next couple of chapters, which is Christian liberty. You know, as, as Christians, we can participate in activities that are not expressly forbidden in the Bible. For example, the Bible doesn't for clearly forbid us from going to Disneyland and have a great time, or, or having subscription to, to Netflix or, or Hulu, or going to church with shorts and sandals. I'm sure some of you guys are happy that it doesn't forbid you guys from doing that. Or it doesn't forbid us from having a Bible that it's not New, New King James. But at the same time, not everyone feels free to engage in those activities. You know, some, some may find it wrong to go to Disney or wrong to have a, a subscription to Netflix or, or to come to church in flip-flops. 
You know, to some, that they, they, they might feel like they're sinning, right? They, there's, there's, there's this guilt upon them if they engage in those activities. So in this chapter, Paul is going to explain that we can feel free to engage in those activities that the Bible doesn't clearly forbid us from doing as long as it doesn't stumble or offend another Christian. So before we dig in and, and, and see how Paul is going to answer their, their question, let's, let's just pray for, for tonight's study. So dear Heavenly Father, we just do invite you here with us, wherever we are, Lord, that you are the one that, that teaches us, that you're the one that, that speaks out of me, Father God, and, and reaches to all of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we may just have a, a soft heart to, to receive your word tonight. I pray that we may focus and, and put away all distractions, God, so that we can dedicate this time for you and for you only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything... He knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, then this one is known by him. So before answering their question about meat offered to idols, Paul wanted to make a clear distinction between having knowledge and having love. And he says that that knowledge puffs up, right? That, that knowledge brings pride into someone, but it is love that edifies, that builds up. Now you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with, with the question? Well, the reason is, is that there was a foundational issue that this question was built on. And that issue was that some of the, Corinth, uh, church, some of the Christians in Corinth were boasting in their spiritual knowledge. You know, some of them, they, they became prideful in what they knew. And because of their pride, they were, they were starting to mistreat the weaker Christian. And when there's pride, there are issues. And where there's issues, there's division. And remember from Romans, the weaker Christian is the one that bounds himself with the do's and don'ts. Right? They're the ones that, that, that live with rules and regulations. And it's the stronger Christian that lives in the freedom of Christ the one who, who understands that the law was fulfilled in Jesus and that they can now live free without the rules and regulations, without the do's and don'ts. So Paul is primarily speaking to those Christians who consider themselves strong in the faith, those who have the spiritual knowledge and, and understood their Christian liberty. But the issue wasn't the fact, wasn't that they had this spiritual knowledge, that they understood their Christian liberty. The issue was that they didn't have love for each other. The strong Christian wasn't, there, wasn't using their spiritual knowledge to edify the weaker Christian. Because having spiritual knowledge, again, it's not a bad thing. I'm not trying to say don't have spiritual knowledge. No. You know, Colossians and, and 2 Peter, you know, they tell us to be filled with spiritual understanding and to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. So, in fact, we are encouraged to grow in our knowledge. But that knowledge must be combined with love. You know, our Christian faith isn't only about obtaining spiritual knowledge. It isn't only about absorbing all this theology and all this doctrine. But it's about knowledge applied and applied with love. Because we can learn all the spiritual truths in the world, but what good is it if we're not going to use it to edify others? You know, it, it's, it's like having a, a car manual to build a, a, a fancy sports car. You know, I can have the, this manual, but it doesn't mean that the car will be built, right? And I can boast all day, every day that I have this, this manual, that, that I have the, the, the directions and the steps to build this car. But if, if I don't build it, again, what's, what's the whole point? You know, I have to put into action the directions of these manuals. I have, to, I have to work and, and, and put this car together by applying what's in the manual. Because if I don't, then the car will never be built. Again, what, what good is it that we are absorbing all these spiritual truths 
if we can live out the simple command of loving others as Christ loves us. Like, yes, we must grow in our knowledge of the Bible, but we, we must also live it out. Live out what we know. Because we are not here, Calvary Chapel, us pastors, we're not here to teach you guys about the Bible so that you could win a, a, a Bible trivia game. No, we are teaching you guys about the Bible so that you can apply the knowledge that is in here into your lives. What we learn from the Bible should change us. It should change the way we think. It should change our perspective. It should change the way we treat people, the way we interact with them, the way we, we, we speak to them, and the way we see them. You know, the knowledge that, that is contained in, in the Word Again, it, it isn't meant to just be head knowledge, but meant to change the way of our, the, our way of living. And, and guys, if, you, if we want to see a significant change in our life, we need to start applying the word to our life. You know, if we want to be united, then we must apply the word. You know, if we want to be godly and loving spouses, we must apply the word. If we want to edify the body, we must apply the word. If we want to grow in our trust, in our faith, and in our love for the Lord, then we must apply the word to our lives. Because if we're not letting the knowledge that, 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 con that is contained in, in God's word, and if we're not letting it changes into the image of Christ, then they're nothing but, but facts stored in our head. They're just like the, those facts under the Snapple caps. I don't know if you guys remember those. You know, they're just facts that, 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 that have no significant impact to our lives. They're just facts that, that we know, oh, that's cool, all right, throw it away. You see, we can grow in Bible knowledge and yet not grow in, in, in grace or in our personal relationship with God. You see, it, it is applying what we know with love that actually allows us to be known by God and allows us to know God. 1 John 4, 7 to 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You see, we, we know God not from head knowledge, not from, from studying years and years of theology and doctrine, no, we know God from an intimate, experiential knowledge of God. And this is achieved by our love for one another, by applying God's word with love. Because by claiming that we know God, we then have to reflect who God is through our life, through the way we, we love one another. Because if we don't know God enough to simply live out what he called us to do, which is to love others, to love him and, and to love others, then, then we don't know God intimately. We don't know God on, on a deeper level. And that is why Paul tells the, the Corinthians that they are actually lacking in their knowledge. You know, they think they, they know everything, that they have all this spiritual knowledge. But Paul says, well, you're actually lacking the most important thing. And that is knowing God on an intimate level. And he tells them that their know-it-all attitude was an evidence of their ignorance. And now Paul is going to connect both knowledge and love in answering his, his question to the Corinthians. In verse 4, he says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, one Father, of whom are all things, and, and we for him, and, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we live. Now, again, after telling the Corinthians that knowledge puffs up and that love edifies, Paul is going to tell them how they can apply what he just said to their church. And before he does, 
Paul does agree. He does agree with these strong Christians who believe that an idol is not real, that it's nothing, right? He says that for those of us who have knowledge, including himself, we know that an idol is nothing. And to get an understanding of the time, the Greeks had so many gods, right? Remember in Acts when Paul arrived in Athens, right? He, he saw statues of countless gods. And, and there was even an, a statue called, dedicated to the unknown god. And many Greek cities had city-state patron gods. In Athens, you know, they made the goddess Athena, right, which, which is the goddess of wisdom, their patron god. And in Corinth, they made Poseidon, the lord of sea, as their patron god. And these strong Christian believers in Corinth knew that those Greek gods were nothing at all. They were merely idols created by man. And Paul agrees with them. He says that although they are many gods and many lords that people worship, to us, to us Christians, there is only one God and one Lord, and that is God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why Paul is essentially saying that the meat that is offered to idols are not contaminated. Right? The meat cannot be affected by an idol that does not exist. And the Christians that understood that could freely buy the meat from the temple markets without a sense of conviction. But not everyone felt the same. Not everyone felt they had that liberty. And not er everyone had the knowledge and felt free to buy meat from the temple markets. And this is where Paul is going to hone in on the Christian liberty and the fact that we as, as, as a family have to be considerate of our Christian liberty. That just because we feel free to do a certain thing, it doesn't mean that everyone else does. If we are to love our brothers and sisters, then we have to be considered of, be considerate of them and use the spiritual truths that we have been blessed to obtain to, to encourage and to build up our brothers and sisters. So verse 7, he says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So Paul is reminding those strong Christians that not everyone grasps that spiritual truth that idols are nothing. If someone who, who, who believes that there is something behind this idol and eats meat that was offered to an idol, their conscience would bother them. Their conscience would, would actually go against them. And, and there were some members in the Corinthian church that, 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 believed, that, that, that believed in idols, believed that they, they, they kind of existed in a way. That eating meat that was offered to an idol was wrong. And the reason behind that was because many of them came from that lifestyle. Many came from that pagan lifestyle and understood the significance and the dangers of sacrificing to an idol. They recognized that what they did in their past was wrong and bad. And they did not want to associate with anything that has to do with an idol. And that's including buying meat from a temple market. They, they wanted to separate themselves so much from it that they'd rather go to another market and pay full price. One would think that these Christians probably would be spiritual giants, right? Separating themselves, anything for, that has to do with an idol. You know, guys who, who would go and separate anything that has to do with the world. Right? Guys who would have a Christian barber or, and, and, and have a Christian butcher, who would go to a, a Christian version of Costco, or, or guys who would go to Hobby Lobby instead of Michael's if, if guys go to an arts craft store. But we would think that these guys are super, super Christian for having all these rules and regulations. But Paul says that they're actually weak. Now, now this may sound kind of harsh, but Paul does say that th it's their conscience is weak. And, 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 th and their conscience is weak because it is wrongly informed. It was operating on the idea that there is something to an idol, that an idol can have an effect on an object. And because the conscience of these Corinthians was weak, their way of thinking was impaired with rules and regulations, 
which would cause them to criticize those who had the liberty to buy meat from, from those temple markets and, and encourage them in, in to, to live their lives with rules and regulations. They were putting their own personal convictions on these guys. In verse 8, Paul says, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we, are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. So the food we eat has no spiritual significance. You know, the type of food we eat doesn't make us any holier or, or any worse. So eating Chick-fil-A doesn't make us any holier, guys. Sorry. It's just food for us to enjoy. Except that Beyond Meat thing, that, that's just cardboard. I don't know who would eat that. It doesn't do anything to my sp spiritual walk, but it does add some nastiness to my taste buds. But hey, I'm, I'm not judging anybody if you guys eat that. That's, that's all you. Verse 9, it says, But beware at least somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbly, stumbling block to those who are weak. Paul is giving a, a word of caution to, to, to those strong Christians who were flaunting their liberty around. And he is warning them that, that by showing off their liberty, by not being respectful and understanding to these weak Christians, they are becoming a stumbling block to them. And a stumbling block is something that would cause someone to, to sin or be tempt, uh, tempted for them to sin. So why would these strong Christians become a stumbling block for the weak? Well, verse 10, Paul, Paul says, For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in, an, uh, eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak br a brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So again, the reason why the stronger Christians were becoming a stumbling block for the weak is because if the weak Christian sees their stronger Christian brother exercising their liberty, they may be tempted to imitate that, to want to, to embrace that liberty, even if it goes against their, their conscience. And if they do embrace that, and if they do fall into that, then that will lead them to sin. But then you might be asking, well, I thought you said that eating meat from the temple market isn't a sin. So why would it be a sin for the weaker Christian to eat meat from the temple markets? Well, Romans 14, 21, 23 says, It is good neither, neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. See, the, the weaker brother in his clear conscience thinks that eating meat from the temple market is wrong. And he does not have the faith or, or, or the clear conscience to eat it. And if they eat meat, without, uh, the, the temple meat, without faith, or eat it with, with the feeling of, of guilt and having that thought in the back of their head that they're doing something wrong, that Roman tells us that he is sinning. Then that begs the question, why would it be a sin if he does something without a clear, without a clear conscience if the Bible doesn't clearly forbid it? Well, you see, God has given us certain restrictions on certain things so that, that, that may not be clearly forbidden in the Bible. For example, God has placed a restriction on me from going to Disneyland. But God didn't place that restriction on Justin. No, God placed that restriction through my conscience, right? Through the, the, the feeling and the thought that if I go to Disneyland, I'm doing something wrong. It doesn't feel right if I go to Disneyland. But for Justin, his conscience is clear. He can go to Disneyland all day, every day, and not feel convicted, and not feel like he's doing something wrong. But if I go against my conscience and go to Dis Disney because I see Justin going and having the time of his life and he's pressuring me to go, 
then I am sinning because I will be going against the restrictions that God has given me personally. I will be in disobedience to God. But not only will I be sin sinning, so would Justin for showing off his liberty and influencing me to do something that was against my conscience. And that is why we, as brothers and, and sisters, as, as Christians, we must be careful as to how we ex exercise our liberty. You know, just because it is, just because in, in our clear conscience it's okay to do an activity, it doesn't mean that we can go and show it off to the world or talk about it to everybody. Because is it really worth it to show off our liberty and have our brothers and sisters in Christ stumble because of it? You know, is it worth to, to, to sin against Christ when our brothers and sisters fall into sin because they were tempted by our liberty? You know, and that is why Paul in Romans says to practice your, your liberty privately between you and God. No one else has to know your liberty. Right? You don't have to post on social media that you're having a glass of wine or that you're listening to, to you too or, or that you're watching a certain movie. Because if you, if you know someone that is struggling with, with, with a certain liberty or with a certain aspect, or, you know, and if you know that they're struggling with whether it be alcohol or, or, or music, whatever it is, you know, why, why post that up? Or talk about it if, you, if they might be tempted to, to fall into that. Keep, keep your liberty between you and the Lord. And you're probably thinking, why, why do I have to be private with what I do? Why do I have to, to hide in a sense? Why can't they just understand and leave me to openly express my liberties? Well, the reason is, is because that way of thinking is the way the world thinks. Everyone else thinks about themselves. Everyone else only think about themselves. There is no consideration of others in the world. But guys, for us, as Christians, we are called to a different lifestyle. We are not called to think about ourselves, to have this, this selfish mentality. No, we are called to love our brothers and sisters, to be considerate of their weakness and of their conscience, even if it means that we sacrifice our liberty, liberty for, for, the, for the sake of our brothers and sisters. And that is what Paul says in verse 13, that if by eating meat, any kind of meat, will cause his brother to stumble, then he will never eat meat again. Paul was so considerate and loving to his brothers and sisters that, that he didn't want to do anything that, that would cause them to stray away from the Lord that would cause them to, to sin. Why? Again, because he loved them and he, he was considerate of them, considerate of their weakness, and he did not want to do anything that would, that would stumble them. Do we have that love for our brothers and sisters? Are we willing to sacrifice our liberty for them? And are we willing to sacrifice a post on social media so that our brothers and sisters who will look at it won't be tempted to fall. You know, we may be filled with, with spiritual knowledge, but if we're not using that knowledge and love, then what good is it? You know, again, I'm not here to say to stop practicing your whatever liberty God has given you. I, I'm not here to say that. But what I am saying is that we have to be wise with our liberties and really think about how our liberty can affect others. And for those who, of us who are weak, let's not criticize or, or even be jealous or envious of the liberties of our brothers and sisters. You know, nor should we try to put our own personal convictions on them. You know, telling them that, that they shouldn't be doing that or they shouldn't be doing this, that they should be restricting themselves because we're restricting ourselves. You know, I, I truly believe that this chapter applies to all of us. And I believe that this chapter really encourages to be united in fellowship, to know one another, to, 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 to know each other's weakness and strength so that in love we can build each other up. You know, it encourages to be sacrificial with one another. You know, I just think of, of, of Christ and 
the, the rights, the liberty that he had as God. He, he had his, 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 his title as God and king, his throne, his power, but he put that to the side for us so that we could be relatable to him, so that we can come to him, so that he can, can know us and, and know our weakness, know our emotions, know our brokenness. He put all his liberty, all his rights to the side because he loved us, because he wanted to, to, to truly minister to us. He had, he, he had all these spiritual truths, but at the same time, he came at our level. He wasn't boasting about his, his position as God or, and as king of the universe. He came humbly before his people to minister and to die for them. Again, that's, that's our example. That's the example that, that we need to live by. To be sacrificial with one another. To be, even to put our own desires before, uh, before our brothers and sisters. No, I apologize. To put our brothers and sisters before our desires. Um, because on, in, on, in all honesty, because that's what we're called to do. We're called to love our brothers as Christ has loved us. Right? Romans 13.10 says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, the Corinthian church was filled with pride, boasting in their knowledge and, and in their liberties because, and because of that, your church was divided. They didn't care about their brothers and sisters. They did whatever they wanted to do. They weren't considerate of, of, of their emotions. They didn't care about their spiritual walk. They didn't care of how their liberties would affect them. They was like, well, this is my own liberty. I get to do whatever I want with it. But Paul is saying, no, you, you really can't. Because you have to be considerate of your brothers and sisters. You have to be united with love. And as believers, you know, let's be wise with how we live our lives. Let, let's think about our brothers and sisters. And, 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 and instead of, of, of exercising our liberty and showing it off, let's use what we know from Scripture and, and use it to, to minister and to build up and to encourage our brothers and sisters, to, to lift up those who are weak, to those who are living a life that, 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 that seems to be filled with rules and regulations, and build them up patiently and understandably. Not, not come to them in this, in this pride where we're like, well, I know more than you do. So you have to listen to me or, or, or just your rules and your regulations, your consciousness, whatever you came from, doesn't really matter. Just do it. No, we have to come to our brothers and sisters patiently, lovingly, understandably and, consider and, and being considerate of them. Again, let's put our desires and our liberties to the side. Because again, that's what Christ did for us. And then and, and in the next couple of chapters, Paul is going to continue to explain how he, as an apostle, has the right to, to exercise that, that title. And how he, is going, he also uses the example of Christ to come to them as, as, as someone who's not exercising his rights or his authority. And, and as, Christ, as, as Christians, we, let's... let's be Christians who, who, who not only think about ourselves, but think of others. Put others first before us. Amen? Let's pray. So dearly, Father, we do thank you, God, for your word and for your love and, and, and the example of your son to us, that, that he did sacrifice his rights, his liberty, so that we can have life, so that we can have eternal life, Lord. And I do pray, God, that, that as Christians that we can apply your word to our lives in every aspect, in every degree of our life, Lord. Let us take what we know, what we've been taught, and let's live it out, Lord. Let us, let us love our brothers and sisters, but let's also love those who are lost, God. Let us bring them to, to your Son so that they can truly see and experience the love of your Son, Father. Again, we thank you 
God, for this opportunity that we get to be in your word. Help us to, to, to learn from it, Lord. Help us to encourage our brothers and sisters from it, Lord. And we love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.